brother. brother! And welcome everyone to a Frequently Asked Questions video where Ben and I are going to be trying to ask some of the most asked questions about our five-part series, What If James Kept the Invisibility Cloak? Yeah, this is, this is really kind of like a fun one because everybody who watches the channel are kind of like independently experts on this story in their own right. Right. And like, so whenever we're writing, we're always trying to account for like, all of the sort of like, like descending variables. Like, okay, if we change this, then what does that mean for all of these characters? And right. what does it mean for all of those characters? Like, if we modify this rule, does that conflict with like the existing canon as we know it in any way, shape, or form? So you guys went through, you've asked a bunch of questions across all five parts. We've sort of condensed them down into, I think about a dozen or so that we're going to attempt to answer for you today. Yes, so Isabel is going to uh, ask us each question and then we're gonna, we're gonna try to break it down as best we can. We got this, right? Yes. Hopefully we didn't make any glaring mistakes. Hopefully nothing too glaring. Isabel, what do you think? Any glaring mistakes? Um, I think you guys did a great job. I oh. thoroughly enjoyed editing it. Yes, excellent. Hey, brother! Why couldn't all three, James, Lily, and Harry, hide under the cloak together? The premise in the series is that Voldemort is unable to kill Harry as a baby because he simply cannot find him in the house. The cloak, like, makes him literally unfindable. My body's gone! Yeah, yeah, so the, the, the mechanics behind that, I think, are kind of, like, interesting or curious, I think, based on, like, a few other questions that will show up today. Yeah. Um, but it, it all sort of stems from something that we learn from Dumbledore inside of King's Cross Station, where he basically says that, like, the cloak never could have worked for me the way it did for you. It's true master. And it's like, when you hear that sentiment expressed, it's like, at and no what point... what did it do? Like, Ron uses the invisibility cloak and is invisible underneath it. Right. Like, what added features does the cloak actually have to its true master, which in this case would be Harry. So right. basically inside of Godric's Hollow, I think what's happening is that they're still under the Fidelius charm. Right. So they, they're not like, certainly not expecting an attack of any kind. Right. Voldemort still surprises them. And yes. I believe in the main story, like James is downstairs and Lily is upstairs putting Harry to bed. Or like, yeah, it says like, take Harry, like I'll yeah, hold take him Harry. off. Right. And, and yeah. Voldemort's like, ha ha, you're unarmed and I'm Voldemort. Right. So, so they're still caught off guard. We assume they still sort of end up in the same room situation. So like, they don't have the cloak just with them, like, oh man, at any second, it could happen. Like, right. they, they are unaware of the, necessarily the power of the cloak. Yes. Or, yeah. like, how it will work. So, uh, Voldemort would still just kill James, because he doesn't even have a wand, and then he'll walk upstairs, and Lily's like, oh yeah, Pfft. throw the cloak on him. Like, last ditch effort, obviously he's coming up the stairs. Exactly. You know, yeah. Lily then does not put herself under, because she's trying to plead with Voldemort, which is then necessary for the sacrificial love to take place, so... Uh, that's that's really why they. I mean, I guess I, I, had they really been just paranoid, they could they could have, I suppose. But right. like they're they're not. They're I mean they're already under the Fidelius charm, so I don't think they're living every second of every day of their life because we're talking like months, if not years, that they've been in hiding or would need to be in hiding for. So it's like once you're inside of the home, you can generally assume that you're going to be safe. You're good. And then, so the other thing too is that James is the master of the cloak up until his death, at which point in time it would literally transfer to Harry by, right. like, by like minutes, by seconds, minutes, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah, by the, whatever time it takes for Voldemort to run up the stairs. Yeah, <laughs> too late! <laughs> I sort of like to imagine he's like kind of like hurrying and like yeah. trips over his cloak a little bit. Oh, no. like, oh man! Yeah. <laughs> the cloak is like trips downloading new cloak. ownership. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not enough clumsiness happens in epic tales, you know right. what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I feel like people also point out all the time, it's like, oh, Harry, Ron, and Hermione got under the cloak. Yeah, three 11 year olds. Not right. yes. yeah. 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 adults and a baby. Well, <laughs> to that point though, the cloak does set like it's weird because the cloak has a certain amount of magical properties in terms of like being able to change its overall size like harry can fit it in his pocket you know at yeah. times and it's like if you ever tried to fold up your own coat and put it in your like pocket you know like you can't it's huge it's yeah, huge yeah, yeah. so there, there's there's something there's something about the cloak that sort of like defies all all laws but, of physics. Right, like, it, it seems like it can make itself smaller, but at some point, it, it is, like, it only gets so big because, like, their ankles will be exposed after they're right. too big. Yeah, yeah. So. Then, then there's the age-old question of, like, if, like, they're, like, standing above you, can you see, like, up because it's not covering, like, their feet? Uh, right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like, I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. How would Harry survive under the cloak if Voldemort destroyed the entire house? What we ran into from, like, a, like a writing standpoint was 
if the house is still underneath the Fidelia's charm, the issue would be that even if Voldemort could not find Harry, um, that if he just leaves, then nobody else can find the house. Right, uh, so we needed, we needed someone else to be able to, like, come recover Harry, because otherwise he'll just die of, like, starvation. <laughs> Which is extremely sad yeah. and, and not, not fun for plot purposes. So basically our, our sentiment here, and I actually think it tracks with pretty much what we see um, Voldemort do when he finds out that the cup has been stolen, where he just goes into essentially like a fit of rage yeah. and he's like attacking people left and right. Um, except in this instance, the only people for him to attack would be James and Lily who are already dead and Harry who he can't find. So right. the idea is that sort of like in his frustration, he just sort of starts like exploding, you know, spells in every direction, which then sort of like destroys the charm that is protecting, you know, the house. The house yeah. And in the meantime, Harry just isn't struck. Isn't like, struck. I mean, you could call it luck. You could say maybe the cloak actually does protect him in some way. It's not really how it works, but you know, for the say otherwise the story's just over. Otherwise know? the story's yeah. just over. Yeah. So like it's kind of like if you want to call it lucky, if you want to call it fate, like whatever you want, like however you want to approach it. But I suppose like through our own logic, if Voldemort had successfully pointed the spell at where the cloak was, maybe it would have hurt Harry, but in our version of it, in order to move forward, it just didn't. It just didn't. Yeah. So yeah. So he just gets angry that he can't find Harry. Right. So enough to destroy the house, not quite enough to actually impact Harry. I mean, yeah. the house kind of gets destroyed in the original anyways, and well, Harry lives. It yes. does. Yeah. That, that's also true. Harry, even in the destruction of the house anyway, he survives the destruction of the house in the main story. That's yeah. a good point. Yeah. yeah. And and in that case, it usually, the way I picture it, at least, I don't even know if it's described this way, is that I always imagine like the room, like Harry's nursery or whatever, it's almost like the wall has been like blown off of that. I never imagined like the house like in Crumb full Yeah, I don't level. imagine it's not like rubble. Yeah. There's still a house there. Right, right. Just, yeah. How does the twin core still choose Harry if he doesn't have Voldemort's soul inside him in his first year? Ah, well the question is, do you think the wand only chooses him because of the soul to begin with? Yeah, this, this is an interesting distinction for sure because like it obviously plays certain roles. Like Harry's ability to speak parcel tongue is specifically due to the piece of Voldemort's soul right. residing inside of him. Right. Right. Probably an argument to be made, well, I don't even know an argument. Would you say that the reason that the Sorting Hat considers Slytherin for him is because of Tom Riddle? Or do you think no, that Harry himself I don't think so. just has but, some... Well, so here's the thing, here's the thing. The wands are a pair no matter what, right? And so the real question then might be like, why would the first wand have chosen Voldemort? Also a fair you question know? when when it's coming like, from Fox. Right, um, so it's like the, the wands seem to like know something about Voldemort and Harry ahead of time anyway. The, the big thing to me, because I think, I think the Holly Wand would choose Harry no matter what, that could be explained in some way, shape, or form by the fact that these two entities are already sealed together by the prophecy by Trelawney, right. so like we know that they're going to have to engage in battle because the <coughs> prophecy exists. The other really big thing to me, though, is at the very end of the story, we know that Harry uses the Elder Wand to repair his broken Holly Wand, which yes. I think at that point going forward, you can generally presume Harry uses for the rest of his life. Yeah, the right? Holly Wand, yeah, he continues yeah. to use that wand. So like that to me suggests that like there is a pairing between Harry Sands Horcrux that works with the Holly Wand. He can't, however, continue to speak parcel tongue after the Horcrux is destroyed. Right, but so, the wand the wand still chooses him like because the wand is broken. So the Horcrux inside of him gets destroyed. He repairs the wand. The wand continues to choose Harry. It continues to choose. Yeah. yeah. Like otherwise, you would think that like without Voldemort's soul, the Holly Wand would not be the correct wand for Harry. But I just would completely disagree with that. Right. Sentiment. So, so yeah, I don't. I don't think. I think the Holly Wand was destined for Harry, and I think the U Wand was destined for Voldemort. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. If the cloak makes the owner unfindable, why can Moody's eye see through it? And how does Draco find and beat Harry up on the train? Excellent points. We we considered both of these things even as we were writing it. We did. Um, so when it comes to Moody's eye, the, so I have three points about it. When it comes to Moody's eye, the fact that the eye can see through the Deathly Hallow invisibility cloak in canon. In in canon, yeah, yeah. It's not even just in our story. I think that speaks more to the mystery of the eye. I, makes, I think it makes the eye more mysterious than it makes the cloak like less mysterious. What it tells me is that the eye is way more powerful than we realize and that we, we just don't know what the history of the eye is or where he got it or whatever. Other than I guess at one point we see a flashback. We see a flashback to where he has two regular eyes. Yeah. So like it's 
I don't, where did it come from? Where did it come? I know. Yeah. yeah. The the thing that I've always thought would be incredibly interesting is that we also learned that Grindelwald has a blue eye. Right. And so something that I would sort of like latch on to is that like if Mad Eye and Dumbledore have worked together for a very long time, that it's entirely possible that Mad Eye was a part of the team that ultimately took Grindelwald down. Mm -hmm. um, and if that was somehow the case, then maybe like Moody was presented with or gifted or like came to own what was otherwise an eye that Grindelwald possibly sought out. Because you got to remember, Grindelwald also has the Elder Wand. Right. Like, he has one of the rarest and most powerful magical artifacts that we know to exist. I mean, we, we don't have anything major to go on other than Mad-Eye and or, the Dumbledore trust Mad-Eye. They have worked together historically. Possibly it's something to jump possibly off with there. something there. But, like... It's it, otherwise absurd that Moody's eye can see through the cloak. It is. It seems like, I mean, it, it feels almost like a fourth hallow or something. I, mean, I don't know. Maybe that's why Death couldn't find the third brother, because he was missing the eye that could see through the cloak or whatever. I don't, you know. I mean, the all-seeing eye is such a common trope in so many different versions right. of fantasy. Yeah. So the idea that there exists in the wizarding world an all-seeing eye that's just not part of, like, the Potter saga lore right. makes isn't sense there, Isn't there something, like, in Norse mythology where, like, Odin loses his eye and, like, that's where the world tree grows? or something uh i'm not i'm not i'm I not brushed know. up enough but, maybe not but i mean something something they harry buries his eye at the most gnarly looking tree <laughs> that's true yeah that's true yes There's he that. does that's a that's a really good point yeah so is the eye at the bottom of yggdrasil something like yeah, yeah, yeah i don't know that's the moody part of it the draco part of it that's just a canon question and it's just comparing our version of the cloak to the canon cloak um draco sees his ankle goes up there so like draco has reason to suspect that some someone is up there and even specifically harry didn't mummy ever tell you it was rude to eavesdrop potter yeah and and i think <clears throat> that this once again kind of goes back to what we said about like why baby harry could survive inside of godric's hollow it's like if voldemort had just luckily blasted a spell where harry was it's like conceivably it would have worked yeah I so mean, uh, I, I think it would have because draco hits Harry with Petrificus Totalus whilst under the cloak. Yes. And, like, yeah. I don't think they say it shields from spells at any point. Maybe not, yeah. yeah. So that's that's <clears throat> the big thing there, is that, like, possibly what, what has happened is that Draco knows physically where he is, and therefore the spell is able to, like, hit its mark successfully. Right. I, I'd be willing to allow for a small amount of gray area on that particular occasion. I, I would as well. The other thing we thought of on this case is that, like, perhaps the unfindable nature of the cloak is that it will make you unfindable to someone whose intent it is to kill you. Yeah. Which would be the other reason why then, like, Voldemort specifically just literally cannot find Harry, but, like, Draco could surmise that. But it even even that doesn't matter because he saw his ankle, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. he knows he knows about where he is. But I don't hate that, though, because, I mean, the idea is that the third brother, Ignotus, was able to use the cloak to evade death right and, and that death, would be death's, death's trying to kill you yeah death's whole trick was that the elder wand basically made you the target of death the resurrection stone made you desire death or yeah. to pass through the veil that would also explain then why like you know um harry would show up on the marauder's map under the cloak and why moody's eye could see him which i guess it's barty Cop jr and he is eventually trying to lead harry's to his death but like his intent when looking at Harry with the eye isn't like to walk up to him and murder him. That's true. Yeah. yeah. If Harry doesn't have a horcrux inside of him from the beginning, does that mean the Dursleys are going to be nicer to him? <laughs> no, absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I, I know that this question, I think we even made a video about it once upon a time. It goes back to the sentiment like that if Ron feels as miserable as he does while wearing the locket, then were the Dursleys just subjected to the same kind of misery while living with Harry? Which I, I think like from a, from a very, very shallow perspective, it's like a fun question to pose, but no, I think that puts too much of, like, the responsibility Gives the for Dursleys it. way too much credit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The Dursleys are mean people. The Dursleys are mean people. Even yeah. before Harry gets there, McGonagall's talking to Dumbledore out in the street and he's like, you can't mean these people, Dumbledore. I've watched them all day. They're the worst sort of muggles imaginable. Yeah, the, you know, the worst sort, the of, the worst muggles. sort of muggles. Yeah, yeah, like, they're already considered the worst. Yeah. Like, even before, like, Petunia already hates, like, James and Lily 
Or maybe, I don't know. She already is disgusted by them ahead of time. Jealous. Je she's well, she's jealous. jealous. She is yeah. jealous. Yeah. But um, it, it manifests in mean ways before Harry gets there. Yeah, so while while it would be nice to consider a world where the Dursleys aren't so mean to Harry, I don't, I don't think, unfortunately, Harry gets to dodge that bullet. I've always attributed it to, like, when Ron is getting all mad wearing the Horcrux, Voldemort is basically at, like, peak. His soul is probably, you know, rocking it. Having <laughs> That's a, true, too, Having yeah. a good old time in that horcrux meanwhile when harry's just growing up Voldemort is like half dead well the other thing is that like ron and hermione are around harry all the time and they're never affected by the horcrux in this way that's you know, also like, true. it's not like yeah. harry is like a burden to everyone he meets all of the time because what of the a horcrux. bummer <laughs> yeah yeah we, we don't spend a huge amount of time like with any of the other horcruxes either but like at least harry's time carrying riddle's diary around in year two it doesn't seem like he's being impacted although he's less impacted by the locket either way than ron is yeah um i'm just trying to think like because you know part of the locket that i think could be specific to its defenses um is that like typically a locket is going to store something that you would like lock inside like it's like your heart's desire or whatever and like yeah. it seems like what the locket is doing to ron is sort of like using his like heart against him a little right. bit because that's where it like presents this idea that like hermione prefers Harry and his mother prefers Harry. Yeah, it's just like whispering all of his darkest thoughts to him all the time. Yes. But yeah. like the locket affects Harry and Hermione when they're wearing it too. Take it off. I said take it off now. True. Like it's yeah. just the worst with Ron and specifically when they're hungry. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, no, which also the Dursleys were never hungry. <laughs> <laughs> fact. Why would Karkaroff not be in Azkaban since he was only freed after he identified Barty Crouch Jr. as a Death Eater? Oh, that's actually a pretty easy one. Yeah, so the yeah the basic thought there is that like you like you even include like he was only freed, uh, but he was never captured never in the caught. first place because right. Voldemort never falls right. in the first place. So like Death Eaters are not being rounded up. Right. And so the idea is that like Karkaroff just is and always has been an active Death Eater all the way just up until... Unbeknownst to anyone. Yes. He's just doing yeah. a good job of being undercover and heading up the dark arts school. Right, which I think a lot of what you could sort of like understand with that is that the when Voldemort is unable to attack baby Harry, he's creating that false calm inside of the wizarding world right. in a way to like sort of like allow people to sort of like lower their guard and believe that Harry did defeat him that night, which is just not the case, but it also means that the Death Eaters are able to just continuously like work and infiltrate and like rise to positions of power during this period of time. Right, so, yeah. Karkaroff even being at a school just sort of stands the reason any Way, especially if it's a school that leans more towards the dark arts. Right. I mean, this is this is otherwise a school that hired him after he was a known Death Eater. So this would be them hiring him, believing him to just be an upstanding person. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So <coughs> if anything, yeah, that was one where it was kind of like, actually, this is really interesting because there will be a very active Death Eater on the ground. Right. As of the Triwizard right. Tournament. He's normally so. a red herring, but this time is just red. Just yeah, just <laughs> yeah. red. Yeah. Why would Harry be Fleur's lost item and not her sister? The argument here would be that like in the main story, Fleur goes to the Yule Ball with Roger Davies, but Gabriella is still her thing. So so like if Roger wasn't, why is Harry? Yeah. And um, I think let's just put up like uh, Harry versus Roger. You know, I mean, right? I like, mean, seriously. Look, look, look. Yeah. In this situation, in in our version of events here, Harry at the Quidditch World Cup has literally months ago just defeated Voldemort, like apparently for realsies. Yeah. You know, so like Floor is very enamored with Harry. So, like, in, in the main story, Roger asks Floor, and she just sort of says yes. But in this in this situation, Floor asks Harry. Harry is, like, hot stuff. But I am the chosen one. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know. Um, and it's sort of an interesting one as well, because I always think it's kind of strange that, like, Cho would even be Cedric's thing beneath the oh, surface of the lake. Yeah. Because, like, Harry asks Cho to the ball, and it's, like, at that point in time, it's definitely not clear that Cho is actively dating Cedric. She's just, like... Someone else asked me, and I said I'll go. Like, right. you know, it's like, but then all of a sudden, it's like, well, then as of the Yule Ball, it's like now we are official. Yeah, like, yeah, but it's only um, been like a, well, like a month, right? The second pass is in February. It's in February. Yeah, and so Yule the Yule Ball's at Christmas. Christmas, so it's yeah. been like a month. Yeah, that's enough time. Yeah. Well, like, why isn't it Cedric's dad? You know, I don't know. <laughs> right, yeah, my boy. <laughs> but we know, oh boy, that would have been even worse oh, in some that ways. Would be terrible. That would make that. Honestly, I almost wish it had been because that would make like the end of the third task like hit that much harder. Oh my gosh, you're right. Oh, yeah. Gosh. <laughs> Oh, that's that's stuff to think about. Mm, anyway, yeah. 
Anyway. Did Cedric die in your version? I don't even remember. Cedric, no, Cedric doesn't die in our no. version. No, no, because the the Triwizard thing isn't in. Like they do the thing at the lake. True. Yeah. Yeah. So he's yeah. just sort of down there. Yeah. <laughs> for Joe. What happened? <laughs> yeah. Although at least he's not competing for you know attention this time with Harry. It's true. true. Yeah. True. Yes. Yep. Everybody gets to root for Cedric this time. Except okay. for everyone rooting for Floor because Harry. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think Dumbledore would have let Harry be at the bottom of the lake? Obviously, yes, because it's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> this was this was really an interesting one, though. Like for, this was another like sort of from the writing standpoint, we we knew at this point in time we wanted to have Voldemort sort of have his uh, priori incantatum attack on Harry, and it was sort of like, well, if Harry's not in the tournament because there's no plot. Right. Like, because because Voldemort assumes he will have destroyed him at the Quidditch World Cup. Right. Then it's like, okay, we need a way for Harry to be in a vulnerable position. But right. he, there's no reason for him to need to compete because there would have been no, not enough time for Barty Crouch to be set up to be, like, Yeah, to do all know, the things. So all, there was, there, and it, it was, like, an interesting writing challenge because you're like, okay, we, there are a bunch of things we need to get around. Like, we have to get through the twin core and we have to get like through the the we have to get like either get rid of the holly wand or like have Voldemort away to overcome the golden fire like we know these things will happen yes it's like what what do you get to the point where it's just like oh well Voldemort and Harry fight and he has the golden fire so he just wins and that's right. just it yeah. yeah yeah but like our, our big thing whenever we're writing any of these is that like we we don't want to like completely deviate from the key story points we want to change how we're arriving at them right and it's like um, we're not and it's you know we're not really ever aiming for a specific outcome or thing or something it's like the the fun thing about the what ifs is it's like we're really just trying to like discover what would happen exactly you know exactly like, so. yeah yeah <clears throat> and then and then that's where we can take some creative yeah freedoms. some liberties yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah <laughs> well at that point would dumbledore have even would he believe that voldemort has been defeated as well or does he know that he's still kicking it uh, well, like, even in the main story, Dumbledore is like, yes, Voldemort will come back, but he doesn't seem to be concerned that Voldemort will come back, like, in a couple months. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, like, I don't, I think his guard might have been down a little bit. It's, I mean, it's enough to the point where, like, you know, in year one, we know that Dumbledore is aware that something's off with Coral and he just allows it. But, like, he's taken off guard by somebody impersonating Moody. Right. Like, like he doesn't know that that's happening. Right. So. Uh, I wonder if in, in in our version, does he suspect Karkaroff of anything? Obviously not, because he gets away with it. Well, I mean, even if even if he did, you know, it's like, yeah, I don't know. It's a, it's a good it's a good question, but I'm not sure. Mm, okay, you kind of already answered this. They asked why can Harry be seen on the map when he's underneath the cloak. Well, so there's two answers here. We sort of said this earlier. We're like, when the cloak would make you unfindable is when someone is trying to specifically kill you, um, as part of like the the Deathly Hallows thing, and like death is looking for the third brother. Um, the other thing that might make the map an exception either way is that the map was made by James, who was the and also the master. a master of the cloak, like especially even when he made it. Yes. So so there's that part of it as well that maybe um it, it's a yeah, yeah, it's a it's a strange one to compare like those magical artifacts a little bit because because things are so very different. The other big thing is that I think the main occasion where Harry is spotted on the map by anybody is by Lupin, Lupin who, yeah. like, the the events of Prisoner of Azkaban don't happen in our narrative. Like, Lupin is still teaching during the third year and, and all the rest, but everything underneath the Whomping Willow and the Shrieking Shack, like, the rest of that yeah. stuff just doesn't transpire at all. Right. So. so this is the thing, it's a question for, like, if we think this is how the cloak work, why does it work? The, why doesn't it stop Lupin from seeing Harry in the main story? Exactly. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. But then our other theory about the map is that, like, the reason Fred and George never see Peter on the map as scabbers is because only marauders can see other marauders on the map. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. So that if it fell into other hands, they couldn't find the marauders themselves, but they can use it to find each other. Right, right. Yeah. Then then the <clears throat> question there is that, like, does Harry become, by birth, an honorary marauder? Well, I would think so. It does, seems like it. Yeah. See, I, I have to imagine that there was some type of, like, blood-packed handshake. Blood seems important, yeah, that, right? Yeah, that would have gone into the, the map itself. Of course. It seems like it's kind of like a... It's like a reddish brown bloody color, isn't it? You know? I do not. This is just a nitpick for me. I do not like the way the map is portrayed in the movie. 
Do you this, think? Do you think it's this too is, big? It's too big. To me, it's like a. It's like a more like a treasure map. It's like this big. You oh. know? I mean, I would just assume that in in universe, it's more magic and like can be small or be big, similar right. to the cloak. You can itself. like you can like it's pinch like, and let zoom. me just put this in my pocket. Yeah, real yeah, quick. yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. He would Harry wouldn't pull that out and be like, stab it of parchment. You know, it has to look like a folded up piece of paper. That looks impressive. Even if I was just carrying around a blank sheet of paper that was folded in that way, you'd be like, well that's clearly that's something. A, something is that askew. Is, that is yeah. askew. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's folded sus. a little bit too nicely for my liking. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know what, when they do the Max series, I hope the map looks different. There you go. If they consult me, which, you know, that'd be cool. Wait, okay, hang on. I just had a thought. So if Harry, why why couldn't Harry see Peter on the map then? If he's an honorary marauder. I think he could. He just doesn't. So he's like looking at the map, you know, just checking it out. What's this thing about? He's like, oh, why is there a man in Ron's bed? <laughs> that, I mean, that's, that's the age old question. That's yeah. like the like, well, seems like someone should have noticed. He's just yeah. very accepting. Good for Harry. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> it's only five of us in our yeah, year, know, but right. like. Who's this guy? It's possible I forgot about this Peter fellow. Yeah. We, have, we do have like a whole video about this explaining it in more detail that probably examines the exact scenarios a little bit more and I'm just trying to remember it. Yeah, right. Yeah. That's fair. That's fair. But, but shout out to our friend Seamus Gorman who I think originally yes, who, came yeah, up with this explanation the, and concept. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How can they apparate to Hogwarts if this takes place in year five instead of six? Yeah, I think right. the confusion possibly is coming from the fact that it was a five part series, but we concluded during what would have been Harry's sixth, sixth year. year. Yeah. Um, the kind of big detail there is that Hermione is almost a full year older than Harry. I think she's born like September 19th or something like that. So it's like Harry will have just turned 11 at the start of like his first school year and Hermione will turn 12 like three weeks into the term. Right. Um, so for one, she's Hermione- She's an outlier birthday. Yeah, yeah. And it shows. And it shows. Um, so Hermione as of our finale would be 17. Yes, but um, also you don't, it's not like you like magically are unable to apparate yes. before you turn, then you just can't get your license to do it. So it would be illegal to do so. But like when Harry apparates back from the cave with Dumbledore, like he doesn't have his license yet. Yeah, he doesn't have his license and like like Ron has failed, <coughs> Hermione has it, but I guess he's with Dumbledore, which, you know, seems like enough authorization to just kind of wing it. Being me has its privileges go for yeah. it or whatever. But yeah, he won't turn 17 until the following summer, so. It feels like the sort of thing where it's like, if you can do it, like, they can't really, like, if you do it successfully, they're not gonna know you did it at all. Yeah, right, 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 right. It's yeah. like when you splinch yourself, they're like, well, 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 time to write somebody a ticket. <laughs> Let's throw some salt in your splinch wounds, you know? <laughs> That sounds like the worst thing ever. Yeah, yeah. Splinch is a terrible word. It's a terrible word, but it's the right word. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so, anyway, um, so otherwise, it's also like a life or death situation. Like, you know, Voldemort's about to take over the world, so. You really think added. the ministry cares more about uh, underage apparition than like. Yeah, the, the, the takeover <laughs> of the free world. Yeah, over. yeah. I, I, the, I was gonna say that you might wonder like, would they have had training in apparition? because they weren't really at school that particular year. But I would, I, it feels like the sort of thing Hermione would have been reading up upon. Yeah, yeah, herself definitely. Herself anyway. Uh, that's the, the best answer that we have. We did talk about that though, when we were writing, we were like, oh, wait a second. Like the year is wrong for yeah, this particular for ability, but it, it feels like there's enough edge cases that it just can still work. Yeah, they figure it out. What happens to Remus and Peter in this version? Uh, we have a little bit of this where when Harry goes to Grimald Place and is able to find the the RAB locket with Sirius like very quickly and discover that he's his godfather. So the way it could have gone for Peter. Well, one, Sirius never went to prison because he can't get Peter because Peter can still be protected by Voldemort who never falls. Right, so Voldemort yeah. doesn't fall. So, but like Peter would have still told Voldemort about the Potters as the secret keeper. Yes. Um, so that still would have happened. So either what happens is after that night, normally, yeah, Voldemort falls. So like Sirius knows that Peter uh, betrayed them but because Voldemort falls, Peter has no one to protect him, so Sirius is able to go hunt him down. So either Voldemort just protects him anyway and Sirius can't find him, or Voldemort kills him because he's like, yo, I couldn't find the baby. Yeah, yeah, um, which doesn't sound unlike Voldemort. It does to, sound. To return from Godric's Hollow being real mad. Real mad, because like now I gotta wait 10 years for that kid to show up at Hogwarts, maybe. I think he either kills him or Peter becomes a pretty, um, like, just, an ineffective Death Eater who is like 
sort of like a very bottom tier, like, wow, your information was the worst. Yeah. And now you'll be punished forever. Peter sort of only has a seat at the table, it seems like, anyway, because he's the one who, like, successfully, like, revives Voldemort to his body, but that's also just not necessary right. this time. This time or, or at the very least, there's enough Death Eaters present to do it in Peter's stead. So, yeah, yeah. Peter is either dead by Voldemort or just kind of generally unimportant. Lupin, on the other hand, you know, as we mentioned, still teaches <coughs> uh, Defense Against the Dark Hearts in Harry's third year. That was sort of brought up ever so slightly uh, with Fleur's ability to get past the Grindy Lows. Right, because um, Harry would have talked to her about it. Yeah, you know, because Harry right. excels, you know, in year three, yes. Defense Against the Dark Hearts, and so, like, you know, that's the thing that normally stops Fleur from excelling uh, underneath the water. Good so. thing she's dating Harry. Exactly, exactly. exactly. Mm -hmm. Yep. So she's, she's an ace, which is what gets her down there first, and then back up to the surface, to be like, yo, like, something's yo, missing. My boy's gone. So otherwise, then we don't have we don't have like a, a specific outcome for Lupin. Otherwise, right. I mean, presumably he's still just part of the Order of the Phoenix later yeah. on. Yeah, yeah. What happens to him is like, because is there still a curse on the position? So does he stay the teacher? Or no, there's still a curse on the position. There's still yeah, that happens so, yeah. before the story starts. Right. So. That's that's when. Voldemort, that's when Tom Riddle arrives at school, but he's already starting to like look a little like waxy and red eyed yeah, and all the rest. That's when he hides the diadem. Yes, the night he hides the diadem is the night that it's cursed. So that's like one of those things where they talk about it like in universe as if like it's like, oh yeah, like some believe it's cursed. It's like it, that, we believe that that particular event happens in like 1955. So it's been like 45 years and right. 45 different DADA professors. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty apparent something's wrong. Yeah. Yeah. How did Voldemort hit Harry with Crucio in the elevator if he was under the cloak? I understand why. The, I probably should have brought this up a little bit more because obviously the whole the whole point of this is that if the cloak makes him unfindable, then how could Voldemort hit him with the Cruciatus curse there? And the answer, kind of like we said earlier, it's like when Draco hits Harry with Petrificus Totalis, like it doesn't protect you from spells. Right. I think even in the story, Voldemort is just guessing. He's just like the elevator, boom, and just fires the curse in there and happens and like Harry is in the way of the spell so he does get hit by it even though he's under the cloak right. it is not that Voldemort could have found him or can see him at all he is just literally getting lucky yeah. in that scenario in that scenario so yeah. uh, basically the reverse of what happened in Godric's Hollow yeah what happened to Nagini oh well Nagini's not around at all because Voldemort fails to kill Harry so he's never defeated so he never goes to the forest in Albania and that's where he meets Nagini yep um, so she's just a snake in a forest somewhere yes yep. yeah so Nagini obviously we know <clears throat> exists as of what 1928 yeah. um, so like Nagini definitely predates this story almost entirely, um, except for like barely exists at the same time as Tom Riddle. That is an old lady snake. It is an old lady snake. Man. Yeah, Nagini is quite old. Otherwise, yeah. So uh, Nagini, Nagini is absolutely out there, but just never has the moment to have that relationship with Voldemort. Yeah. Imagine you just get got by a baby and you run to some forest and you find like your best snake friend for life. <laughs> <laughs> what could be yeah. better? Yeah, what we need is the Voldemort story where it's just sort of like, what happened, man? Yeah. Like you're, you're living like a wacky little existence over here. Cause he's also like spirit Voldemort at the time too. So she was just like, yep, I'm a snake and you're like a uh, Demon Cloud, let's You're, be friends. Yeah, I know. <laughs> let's do it. They say that during that period of time, Voldemort could occupy the bodies of like creatures, like rats and snakes and stuff. Yeah. And so it's like, I suppose there's some possibility that like he was able to successfully occupy Nagini, who might be more like durable, given the fact that she was originally human. Right. Uh, than your standard like snake snake. snake. Yeah. So it, there's some possibility, because that's the other thing that we don't really know, is that last we've seen Nagini in the Fantastic Beast saga, she seems to be positively aligned. So it's never really been super clear, unless it has something to do with like Credence's death, uh, why yeah. she would ultimately turn sides. But maybe she's corrupted by occupation by, by, Voldemort. by Voldemort. Or, or it, it, it could be the case that something Dumbledore does leads to the death of Credence by way of killing or like defeating Grindelwald. Yeah, and then and, and so she's aligned against Dumbledore more, more than, than with, with Voldemort. So, yeah. yeah, until you know, then his soul's in her, and then I'm pretty sure she's just pro Voldemort. Yeah. Right. So, big scary snake. If the sword is already impregnated with basilisk venom, could it be turned into a horcrux? Ah, that is a wonderful question. I think we did make a video about this once upon a time. I think so. So it's kind of like the line from Ollivander when Harry gets his wand where he's all like, He who must not be named did great things. Terrible. The sword will absorb anything that makes it stronger, and I don't think it necessarily has like a moral compass 
about what is strength. Yes. So like Voldemort is great. So if he's putting his like great in terms of like power, despite the basilisk venom in there, if he's adding his soul there, that might be considered more powerful. Right. So it would make it would overall <laughs> make the sword that much stronger. Right. You know, by by way of having a piece of Voldemort himself in it. Right. It's sort of the same thing. It's like the basilisk venom's in there, but it's not killing the Horcrux because it's like the, it now it's just part of the container, and the container itself has to be destroyed. Right. So there's that. Probably. <clears throat> I guess that would be the thought. Like maybe. Do we know if Hufflepuff's cup is goblin made? Oh, I don't know. I suppose it must not be, right? Otherwise, the Basilisk Fang should not be able to. Because, like, go it's goblin metal that makes anything that, t right. like, touches it stronger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, so I think that there's, a dis like, distinctly different activities happening there. Normally, the sword is imbibed with the, with the venom, which then gives it strength. But the venom wasn't used against the sword in the first place. Right. Which, so, yeah. But if it had been... Possibly could have destroyed it. That's right, a, like that's if you just stabbed it instead of just gotten the venom on it or right, something. Yeah, right. It's a good question though. Yeah. Another sword question. How did Avada Kedavra kill the Horcrux in the sword? Before before you get into like some of the complicated details of it, there is the argument to be made that Voldemort uses Avada Kedavra against Harry, and that's what destroys the Horcrux inside of Harry. Right. So we have at least some basis hard stop for Avada Kedavra being capable of destroying a Horcrux. Right. The difference being that it's like a living being versus like a solid object. Right. But right. Um, then you might ask like, why didn't they use Avada Kedavra on the locket or something like that? And that is a great question. It's hard to say whether or not it would have worked. Um, but it's, it's like I think it's harder to say whether or not they even could have done it. That's like, true because I think like you know Hermione knows that fiend fire could destroy the Horcruxes and she doesn't even bring it up because she's just sort of like it's too dangerous. It's I too would dangerous. never do that. Right. And like I think Harry's whole thing and even like Dumbledore's mission for both Harry and Draco is for them to not have to kill themselves as to such like destroy a piece of their own soul. Right. So it's like. Like, if Harry was using Avada Kedavra on the locket, that would be, like, out of character for Harry, because he would just never use that spell. Exactly. And, like, that would be, like, a kind of killing, which Harry, like, does not do. So it's, like, even though it could be an option, like, it is also kind of not an option. <laughs> right, right, yeah. yeah. It's, like, like that's the question of, like, you know, like, where, where do your ethics lie? But ultimately, in the end, like, when it comes to, like, do or die, like, the, the final moment, like, with the Elder Wand versus... Uh, Draco's wand at the Battle of Hogwarts, Harry goes for Expelliarmus, not Avada Kedavra. Like, right. even in the absolute, <clears throat> like, the moment where it's like... Oh, yeah, Voldemort, like, offs himself in the end. Right, yes, exactly. Yeah, like, the, yeah. the, the, the Elder Wand backfires, I suppose. Yeah. So it's like, that's really what, what does him in, ultimately. And then, I suppose if you want, like, a more, like, magical kind of explanation... Um, you could also argue that the sword absorbs the Avada Kedavra spell, and then because the spell is inside, it just kills everything in the sword. Like, it's like a way to, like, cleanse the sword. Yeah, yeah, almost. almost like, so. It's like, like, F5, refresh. Right, right. <laughs> so it's like, it, like, it doesn't destroy the container, which you would normally need to do, but because the sword is a different kind of container, it can, uh, it, it absorbs it, and then the soul inside is destroyed. The other, the other thing <clears> to keep <throat> in mind, again, going back to the Harry situation where he's attacked with Avada Kedavra, is that it is Voldemort himself who's casting the spell and it is his horcrux inside of the container which is normally harry in the forest so there, there's some other question as to like whether or not like because it's voldemort specifically who's casting avada Kedavra, right whether or not that doesn't like open the door a little bit for like a special amount of like additional like power or influence with the spell in terms of attacking its own self right yeah, yeah. did snape live or did avada Kedavra also kill him no snape lives snape lives yeah he just gets knocked back and we just don't see him again but yeah. he's he survived go snape yay i, I guess uh, sort of <laughs> yeah <laughs> Sometimes. 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 The occasionally lovable Severus Snape. Hmm. Potter. All right, this is the last one. Are you ready? Okay. Yeah. Do Harry and Flora end up together in the epilogue? Oh, of course. Of course. Well, the ultimate question. The I know, ultimate question. I know question. Flora sort of is there for the Goblet of Fire or a situation and then just sort of exits uh, the one. That's also true. With, well, not true in the main story because she marries Bill. Yeah, um, I know. This this was one where it was like, it was so fun to use Fleur where Fleur is so important. 
And then it was sort of like, we can't really have her do like one of the major, major things. Like yeah. that would seem so, so like out of place. Or even then to try to like invent the narrative around like Fleur traveling with them or something for some reason. Um, I like the idea that they end up together. What was what was the the number one most upvoted name? Was it Flurry? It was Flurry. Was, it was Flurry. Flurry. Yeah. Oh, okay, I thought okay. for sure it was gonna be Flower Pot, but Flurry. That's fantastic. Flower Pot was number two. Okay. Okay. Flurry. Okay. Flurry's okay. good. So Flurry's stick good. stick with me. Okay. So we've got we've got Flurry. We have Flurry. Flurry and Harry. That's the ship name. We're in the <clears throat> epilogue. We're getting ready to, for their kids or kid to go on the Hogwarts Express to to go to school. Mm -hmm. So if their if their name is Flurry, I kind of like bring snow to mind. Their first date is arguably the Yule Ball, which right. took place Christmas on Christmas. Eve. Yeah. Holly is not only Harry's wandwood, but it is also a common Christmas decor, yes. and, and you could attach to like the winter months. So I would I would suggest that their daughter's name is Holly Potter. Ah, oh, I love it. It's so perfect. I love that. Yeah, not Holly bad. Potter. Very not good. Bad. Still HP. Still HP. It almost is like Holly Potter, Harry Potter. Ha yeah, yeah it's exactly. Like the same. Yeah, like the way you got, spell like, it. Yeah. yeah. We know that Harry loves his middle names though. So what's what's her middle name? Okay, oh, all right. Uh, it's, 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 I mean, it's probably still just like Lily, because Harry's not very creative in this way. Holly yeah. Lily Potter is Holly not Lily. good. Holly Lily? Yeah, that's not good. Holly well, Lily. I mean, the yeah, that, that's all right. I would argue you that Alba Severus isn't very good either. I, yeah, <laughs> agreed, agreed. I, that's, I, feel like, I feel like Lily works so much better if you go with the flower pot name, because Lily is a flower. Yeah, it's a flower, yeah. So. yeah. What's another Holly? It would, it, it would need to stand out in some way. It would need to stand out in some way. It probably needs to be reflective of some other character. Mm, you you know? know, like the like the other, this is just because I think it would sound funny, but the, the mother figure you had, you know, it's just Holly. Molly. Holly Molly. Holly yes. Molly. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Holly Molly Potter. Uh, Not bad. That sounds yeah. like holy moly. <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely what everyone calls yeah, her. Yeah, it's like when they see her, they're like, holy moly. Holy. Like, no, holly moly. Holly moly, actually. Yeah. <laughs> In the end, Flurry is a thing with their daughter, Holly. Poor Ginny. Poor Ginny. That was it was really it was really interesting and fascinating to get all of your questions and I was I was glad like I know that some of them are probably like stretchier than others but I was glad that there was at least some basis of ability to answer each of the questions. Yes. You know, yeah. cause I mean, th this is the type of thing like where if we were ever tapped for like a TV show or something like that to like, to, to do it, we would have way more time. We would battle test the story a lot more. I'm sure you'd have like Potterologists like actually. Yes, 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 yes. But, but no, 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 no. Yes, and Quidditch Through the Ages, page 213. Yeah. There's a line that dictates the following. Do you guys consider um, yourselves Potterologists? Uh, I mean, so yeah, I think yes. Maybe, perhaps. Possibly. Yeah. I mean, I would consider you guys yeah, to be part of this. Yeah, I think so. Oh. Yeah. Oh. You've been in the game for some time. Thanks. You know thanks. a couple things. We know a couple things about Harry Potter, yeah. It's come up. <laughs> it's come up. It's come up. You know, herbology professor might think so. And it's for children. I think it's for children. Oh, <laughs> Let it go. Let no, it go. No comment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But anyway, guys, thank you so much for all of your amazing questions. Thank you for sticking with us for such a long but otherwise very fun series. We hope that you enjoyed uh, the super cutified version of it, uh, which was edited by Isabel, who's with us today. So that's shout me. out to Isabel. Um, but I think that's all for today. Yeah. Until next time, bye! bye.